Saving America, one entrepreneur at a time. It's the Biz Rap Podcast with your host, Michael Manahan. The show that celebrates small business and entrepreneurs, it's Biz Rap Radio with your host, small businessman, educator, and author, Michael Manahan. And welcome to another edition of Biz Rap Radio. It's your host, Mike Manahan, and thank you so much for joining me today. Biz Rap Radio, the show all about entrepreneurs and small businesses. Yes, we're here to help you as an entrepreneur or a small business person. Hey, there's an idea out there which some people object to, but it's called profits. You're in business for a reason. Yes, there's there's other reasons other than profits. There's freedom, uh, the idea of not working for a boss where you can get cancer. And because when your boss screws up, of course, what they do is they always can everybody else, right? They never never can themselves. Uh, big corporations, terrible places to work, rules, regulations, and, and sure enough, the executives at the, in the boardroom screw up and it's 10 or 15 or 20,000 people who get their jobs cut. So you, you, you want to be an entrepreneur, but, but you want to be an entrepreneur and make money. That's what it's all about. You need to make money, put it in your own pocket, take care of your family. If you make enough, take care of your friends, and if you make enough, take care of people in your community. That's the way it's supposed to be. The ideal never this country was never founded on the concept that you take forty percent, fifty percent of what you earn and send it to Washington and they take care of all the problems. You know, years ago people took care of their communities. And that's what many, many, many entrepreneurs do. I'm always amazed when I go into small businesses and uh, around the country and I see how much they're involved in the local community, whether it's uh, assisting the Girl Scouts, whether it's it's uh, uh, giving money to the local homeless people. Uh, small business people get involved. They take care of the community. So small business people make money, take care of your community. Now, we got a wonderful show lined up for you today. I'm really, really excited with the gentleman that is our guest. His name is Marty Zwilling. Uh, he is, uh, his organization is Startup Professionals. He's an author, a consultant, a blogger. Uh, he has 750,000 Twitter, uh, Twitter followers. Can you believe that? Uh, he's contributed to Forbes magazine, on, Entrepreneur Inc., Huffington Post. He has a passion for helping entrepreneurs. Marty, welcome to the show. Well, thank you very much, Mike. It's it's a great pleasure to be here, and I hope I can offer a tidbit or two of advice along the way. Well, we'd love love to hear some tidbits of advice. But uh, uh, wh- how did you how how did this passion for entrepreneurship and your desire to help entrepreneurs how did that all come about? Well, you know, I have a I guess a story like everybody else. I I have a long career in big companies with IBM, and I have to say it didn't quite work out as badly as, as you had intimidated in the, in the beginning, intimated. The the fact is that uh, I did, after IBM, go to work in Silicon Valley for a few years, uh, so I fell in love with startups. Now I'm in more, I would say, a give-back stage of my life, and I decided I would try to help new startups or new entrepreneurs not make some of the same mistakes that I made. And so... Uh, I settled into a volunteer kind of thing, but found that, uh, in fact, people appreciate you a lot more if you charge a little money. And so, in fact, I made a business out of this, and it's now an exciting business for me as well. I think uh, I finally reached uh, the audience that I wanted to reach. Well, that's great. And by the way, that is is a great piece of wisdom that you just said. Uh, I'm also obviously a consultant as well as an educator. Uh it, my experience is people just don't value free advice. If they're not paying for it, there's there's just, I don't know what it is. It's really strange because there's lots of free advice out there. And if people paid attention for it, you could, you, to it, you could really accomplish a lot in this world. But for some reason, if they're not paying for it, they, I don't know, there's this, the, I don't believe it or I'm not going to do it, which is really ridiculous because many entrepreneurs, of course, and small business people don't necessarily have the resources to uh, 
to you know to pay for a lot of the help that they need and that's one of the reasons why I do this radio show we have people on every week who have absolutely fabulous ideas and and, and they're free all you have to do is listen to the show and many of them if you go to their websites they have any everything from white papers to templates to in addition to the things they charge for of course but many of them have you know starter kits that are free and uh, why people, you know, in business don't take more advantage of the stuff that's out there that's free uh, always has boggled my mind. But I certainly agree with you. Well, I think you know it's a it's a good point. The fact is, though, I think a lot of people are overloaded. Uh, we're in information overload, so there's so many things that uh, they have a hard time sorting out the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. And and one of the things that I I guess filters you to the top a little bit is if. If it looks like a lot of people are following you or a lot of people are paying for your services, then you must be more worthwhile than maybe all the other stuff. Well, there's something to be said for that. Now, uh, uh, we're, we want to talk about common mistakes made by new entrepreneurs. Uh, what are some of those mistakes from your experience? What have you seen in, in your travels? Well, one of the most frustrating ones that I see is that people often wait to really formalize their company until – it's too late. Or by that, I mean, for example, they may say, well, now I need some money, so I want to go to angel investors, so we better name the company, we better put some uh, incorporation things in place, and they find out that uh, the name that they want isn't even available. And so uh, they really end up confusing everybody, including themselves, putting a big delay in things. And, and there are some technical issues as well. For example, uh, I think the IRS says if you incorporate a company uh, as a startup, your stock's worth zero, but if you wait until you are you have a product and, and you're selling a product it's and then you try to incorporate, they're going to ask you for some taxes because now you say your valuation is a million dollars or $10 million uh, and, and you want to assign yourself some shares, they want some taxes on that. So I always say name your company, make sure you can get that name on the Internet, get the partner agreements in place, get a business plan put together, and uh, do that as early as possible. Otherwise, you're just going to uh, lose. Yeah, that's good advice. And, 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 of course, people are always asking me, oh, Mike, where do we incorporate? And uh, let me tell you something. It does make a difference where you incorporate, particularly if it's going to be a while before your business, if you're an entrepreneur, and you're not really going to be uh, what I would call really in business for a little while. Well, incorporate in the state of California. Guess what? Going to cost you five hundred, six hundred bucks to incorporate, and then every year the state of California is going to want eight hundred bills from you just for existing, even if you haven't generated one penny of revenue. So uh, you know, think about where you're incorporating. Uh, you can go to Wyoming. The state of Wyoming, Wyoming, will cost you a hundred bucks to incorporate your company. Uh, the the annual fee is uh, I, I can't remember exactly what it is, but it's it's not much more than the cost of a dinner down at your local restaurant. And you, if you don't get the business going for a while, you're not going to be paying huge fees to the state just for the luxury of of having yourself incorporated. Uh, have you do? Uh, Marty, do you have any experience with uh, incorporations and where you think people should incorporate their businesses? Oh, I agree with you 100%. I happen to reside in, in Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, and Arizona is uh, pretty much the map to Wyoming. In other words, you can incorporate here for, I think, less than $100, and annual fees are, are uh, trivial. So I always say you should look at your home state first, but uh, you should look around there there are other reasons. If you think you're going to have a massive corporation with with different levels of stock, then you can go to some of the, you know, to Nevada or uh, a couple of eastern states and get that set up. So there are some choices, but it doesn't really take a super expert or a super lawyer. Do a little research on the internet, and I think you can find out what you need. Yeah, that that's that's great advice. So, okay, if you if you've got that business uh, idea smoldering in your head, maybe you've even created your business plan. You've uh, perhaps even picked out a name. You you got to start using that name. Make see if the website is available for that name, or at least a version of it. Check with uh, uh, probably in your home state and the state you want to incorporate to make sure that. A name is available. You can also, of course, go on to the United States Trademark Office and check to see if the name is available.
available. All the stuff you can do, by the way, by yourself, absolutely free. You, you don't have to pay any uh, expert to help you with that. Uh, but that's, uh, that's really good advice. Get your name reserved. Get a corporation incorporated with that name on it. Get the URL reserved, which could cost you as little as, you know, 20 15 or 20 bucks through GoDaddy or something. But look at we are coming to the end of this segment. We're going to have to go to commercial break. I am on with Marty Zwilling, startup professionals, blogger, author. And uh, Marty, we'll be right back as uh, soon as we finish with these commercial messages. And welcome back to Biz Rap Radio. It's your host, Mike Manahan. Thank you for joining us today. Or, and if you weren't with us on the last segment, uh, if you were with us on the last segment, you know we're talking to Marty Zwilling. He is the founder and CEO of Startup Professionals. He's a, a blogger, uh, an entrepreneur, dispenses advice on the subject of startups to a an online audience of 750,000 people. Twitter followers. He writes with Forbes, Entrepreneur Inc., Huffington Post. And uh, Marty, thanks for sticking with us. Well, thank you very much. Uh, let's let's see if we can help out some entrepreneurs today. Well, first of all, if somebody's interested in, in hearing or learning more about you, uh, listening or reading what you write, uh, uh, where can somebody go to find you? Well, I do have a website, like I always recommend. In my case, it's called www.startupprofessionals.com. And uh, on there, you can go to my blog, blog blog.startupprofessionals.com, or to my Twitter uh, ID, Startup Pro, S-T-A-R-T-U-P-P-R-O. So you should be able to find me just by doing a search on the Internet since I've published uh, pretty broadly and and, uh, uh, should be visible. Okay, fantastic. So it's startupprofessionals.com, or you can check them out on, on Twitter as well. Uh, so, Marty, uh, we, we talked about getting your name reserved, making sure that's available, incorporating your company. We talked about uh, incorporating in a low-cost state like perhaps uh, Wyoming or, or, uh, or Nevada, although Nevada is getting more expensive. But uh, what, other, what other thoughts and ideas do you have for the new fledgling entrepreneur? Well, I think one of the things I face very often is the kind of myth that all you have to have is an idea and people will start throwing money at you. And I think that's just plain wrong, that that every entrepreneur needs to do his homework, needs to start doing the execution of an idea, because I have to tell people that ideas are a dime a dozen. They're really not worth anything. And in fact, uh, you know, what we as investors look for are some evidence that either you have done this before and made a million dollars or a billion dollars, or you have a business plan that makes some sense that uh, shows uh, all the reasons why this may work for you. So, you know, my my uh, message is get started. Don't just toss the idea out there. Uh, that, you know, just excellent advice. Uh, my dad, uh, who's passed away many years ago, my dad was famous for wandering around and seeing things and saying, hey, that was my idea. Somebody stole my idea. And, I, you know, finally one day towards the end of his life, I said, Dad, you know, for years you always said people stole your ideas, but I never saw you actually take one of your ideas and try and make it work. You, you had these ideas, but you never did anything with them. So that that is great advice. If you've got an idea for a business, a new product, a new service, you've got to start putting it into action, uh, you know, on, on some level. And business plan is, of course, a start to that. Uh, and don't fall into the trap that I find, and Marty, you probably find this as well. Uh, I, I, I had a client of mine, actually, that uh, gave me uh, their business plan. And I looked at it. I said, I said to the guy, I said, where did you get this business plan? I, he said, well, I, I found some guy on the Internet, and I paid him $150 to do my business plan for me. I, I said, well, you can't do that. If you're the entrepreneur, your heart and soul needs to be into your business plan because it needs to really reflect the vision of what you are trying to create. It's one thing to hire somebody who perhaps is more articulate with the English language than you are, but still, 
you can't just outsource your business plan to some guy on the internet for 150 bucks. You'll come up with a business plan that nobody will ever bother to look at. And if they do look at it, they will certainly think uh, the poorer of you for having done so. So your business plan has to be more than just uh, a bunch of crap. It's got to actually really reflect the vision and the passion that you have for your idea. Well, Marty, you agree? I absolutely agree, and I, I do face the same uh, same issues. I, I always tell the entrepreneur that you should write your own business plan because of the reasons that you just went over. And in fact, you don't really understand, no one understands their, their real idea until they try to write it down. I think that forces you to think through all of the issues of competition and marketing and, and uh, funding, all of those kind of issues. The people that come to me, and say, well, I just read an article that uh, says you can scratch your idea on a napkin and, and somebody uh, is going to give you money. I, I think unless you're in Silicon Valley and you have a rich uncle, uh, don't worry about it. That's not going to happen. Uh, maybe if you sold your last company for $800 million, somebody's going to be anxious to give you money. But in general, there are a lot more ideas out there than there are, there are people with money. So do it right. Yeah, the, that's the old myth, uh, the two guys sitting in the, uh, you know, I don't know, the Martini Lounge at the uh, Four Seasons there on 57th in uh, in Manhattan, and uh, the one guy scratches his uh, idea on the cocktail napkin uh, over the, the $20 martinis, and the other guy coughs up $50 million. Hey, that may have happened once, but believe me, it, chances are if you're an entrepreneur looking for money, it's not going to happen to you. And don't forget, it's not just a business plan to articulate your ideas and concepts, but technically your business plan is also competing with other business plans that are out there. Uh, anybody with money who's looking to invest in a business isn't just looking at you, unless, again, it's your brother-in-law or your your cousin or something like that, but most people with money who invest in entrepreneurial ventures, whether it be angel investors, uh, high net worth individuals, or uh, or specialized funds, they're looking at many business plans. And so you're not just articulating your concept, your idea to the uh, investor, you're also showing off who you are in comparison to the competition. So if your business plan is a rosy old piece of crap, and somebody else comes in with a slick, polished business plan that's well put together and defensible, there's a greater chance they're going to get funded than you are, even if you have a great idea. Uh, Marty, would you agree? Absolutely. And in fact, what I always say is, I'm, I'm an angel investor, so I know this firsthand as well as I've worked with venture capitalists. Investors invest in people more than they do in ideas. And so, you know, your business plan has to reflect, as you said, you. It has to reflect your passion, uh, your abilities, uh, your team. And, and in fact, I will tell you that as I read business plans almost every day, I flip to the executive section to see who are you, what have you done, how do you fit into this domain, uh, what's your experience. And if, if, if you don't fit, then it really doesn't matter what your idea is. It's unlikely that you'll be able to deliver. Right, right, and 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 that that brings us to another point. What if you have a gr- what you think is a great idea? You pass it by some friends, some associates. Everybody says, "Yeah, yeah, you know that that's a great idea." But you personally don't have uh, perhaps the experience in that particular industry, or perhaps in that particular type of business. Um, how, what do you suggest to somebody who is in that particular situation that they do in order to? make sure they're not being dismissed because of their lack of experience in a certain industry or with a certain type of product? Well, I think there's there's kind of a simple answer to that, and that is find a partner. Uh, you know, I always say, first of all, two heads are better than one in any startup, and certainly those should be one who has uh, the technology or the idea and maybe the other who has the business acumen or the experience. And, in fact, if you don't have both of those in the same startup, it probably isn't going to work as well as it won't find investors. So, so uh, look for that. It, it's like looking for a spouse. It has to have, it has to be someone who has the right chemistry, has the right complementary skills, and the right interests. So it's not going to be possible for me or you to say, "Here he is, here she is." Uh, you need to go out and do some networking and find that person. 
uh, excellent advice, and of uh, and, and I'm going to put on my cynical hat here for a minute because I'm not as I'm I'm not as convinced uh, all the experience and all of that stuff is as important as a lot of people make it out to be. Uh, and there's been a lot of instances where entrepreneurs with no experience have been very successful, but it doesn't matter because at the end of the day, it's the investor you're thinking of, and if the investor believes that uh, you need you need uh, that everybody in the office needs to wear a pink shirt and a blue tie believe me put on a pink shirt and a blue tie and 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 tell the investor that that's the best friggin idea you've ever heard since you were born uh, i mean part of it in terms of packaging yourself for investors is having what the investors want and investors get these peculiar ideas in their mind that's okay they got the money and so if if it will help you get the money by partnering with somebody who brings in additional expertise, even if you think you can do it yourself, it's worthwhile bringing that person in, making them part of your team. And it might just work out anyway. Hey, look, at, we're coming to the end of another segment. It's Mike Manahan, BizRap Radio. We're on with Marty's Willing Startup Professionals. And we're going to be back with more advice for entrepreneurs right after these messages. And welcome back to Biz Rap Radio. It's your host, Michael Manahan. We are, of course, the show all about entrepreneurs. If you're just joining us, we are on the line with Marty Zwilling, startup professionals. He's an author, consultant, blogger. He's written for Forbes, Entrepreneur Inc., Huffington Post. And we've been talking about uh, ideas that will help entrepreneurs launch their new businesses, things that you can do as an entrepreneur. But Marty... Uh, Mention again your website so if somebody's interested in contacting you, uh, they can they can do that. What is your website? It uh, sounds just like my company, www.startupprofessionals.com. Okay, startupprofessionals.com. Go there and check out Marty. Uh, okay, we talked at the uh, top of the hour. We talked a little bit about making sure you have your name down, you've got it uh, registered, you've got a corporation. Uh, Then we started talking about how important the business plan is and how you actually need to have your own personal stamp or imprint on that business plan. It needs to reflect your passions. It needs to reflect, uh, you know, your vision for the business. We also talked about strengthening your team. Uh, If you're going to try and launch a product in an area where you don't have any expertise, there's going to be some hesitancy on the part of the investment community to look at your uh, your idea or your business plan. So you need to bolster your team. If you've never, if you're coming up with a say a consumer product and you've ne- and it, you want to sell it to Walmart and you've never sold to a big box retailer, you need to have somebody on your team who has sold to big box retailers. Otherwise you might not get the funding you need. Marty, what other great ideas do you have? Well, I think one of the others that becomes uh, uh, an issue of discussion often is about patents or intellectual property. There there seems to be a lot of uh, mixed feelings out there about what's the value of a patent or how much it, they cost. I'm a strong proponent that if, you're, if your idea is just an idea, uh, then it's not worth much. But if you can get a patent on it or even a provisional patent or other intellectual property like trademarks, it can be worth a lot. So it's very important that you do that, especially if you're going to investors because investors associate value with that element of innovation and conviction and execution. It's an element that uh, you added which is well beyond the idea stage. Hey, now, uh, I... And I would would agree with you. Uh, of course, the the pushback I always get from people is, well, you know, I I, I called uh, one of these patent attorneys, and he told me it's going to cost twenty grand to file my patent. What wh- how, entrepreneurs? A lot of them don't have twenty grand to file their patent. What what can they do? Is there any uh, workarounds uh, to that issue? Yes, certainly. I think the the very simple thing is to do a provisional patent. You can actually do it yourself. Write it yourself, it costs $100 or less to submit a provisional patent. And basically what that does is hold your place in line as the head of the line for one year. And when you start a startup, 
you don't have any money, like you said, but in a year, you better know whether this is worth anything or not, and within a year, you need to go ahead and file then the real patent. It doesn't cost 20000 Again, if you go to a, a very high-priced lawyer, that's probably realistic, but if you write the patent uh, a primary body part yourself, you can probably get it filed for 5000 So I always say a provisional patent is the right way to start. Yeah, provisional patent, uh, and similarly with trademarks. It, it. Uh, I know I've I've talked to attorneys who say, yeah, we'll file your trademark for you, and they want a thousand bucks or fifteen bucks, hundred bucks. But uh, fact is, you can do a lot of this stuff yourself, and yeah, it's a little bit of a hassle because some of this stuff isn't entirely intuitive. But uh, it's it's it, most of these government filings, you don't need an attorney to do them for you. Uh, most of them don't cost nearly what an attorney would charge. I think it only costs $150 or something to file a trademark. And it's um, and and you, I, I, if you get stuck, there are resources. I mean, you just go on the Internet and type in how to file a trademark, and I guarantee you a, a, an article will come up that is absolutely free that will tell you how to do it. And don't forget that the... Uh, government offices, some of them can be very helpful. I know when I was filing a, a trademark on something years ago, I actually called the trademark office and said, here's what I'm trying to do. What should I do? And they, they, I thought they did a pretty good job of explaining it to me. So it, protect your intellectual property. Trademarks, they're not that costly. Provisional patent, that's where you uh, you don't put all of the detailed information in. You kind of put just a summary. And then, uh, Marty, you say you have a year before you actually have to file the full patent on that? Yes. If, if you don't file any full patent or a regular patent application within a year, then you lose your place in line. Uh, but, in fact, you should be following up by that time if, if it makes any sense. If it doesn't make any sense, you let it expire. Gotcha, gotcha. So that's something that, that can be done for, uh, you know, literally a few hundred dollars. You can get a trademark on your name. You can get a uh, a provisional patent on the go. And then that also bolsters your business plan. And when you're talking to somebody and they say, well, what intellectual property do you have? Hey, we've already got patents in process. We've already got uh, trade names and trademarks. Uh, so you're you're starting to create value in your fledgling enterprise. Uh, and again, it you know doesn't cost a fortune to do some of these things. It's good advice, uh, Marty. We've probably got time for one more gem of an idea. What can you uh, leave us with? Well, there's there's so many of them that uh, I think it's always a trick. One of the most important ones, probably, that a mistake that people overlook is managing your expenses, managing your cash flow. You know, one of the key uh, to a success in a small business is running the business and, uh, you know, also, of course, running the product. So what I find is that a lot of good engineers say, I'm going to focus on the business or I'm going to focus on the product and I'll let somebody else focus on the business. Meantime, cash flow uh, goes down and they're out of business. So I'd say every CEO better sign every check himself and better look at the cash flow every day. Don't leave that to your accountants. It's, it's your business. Uh, that is uh, just such excellent advice. Uh, there's this, I think, misconception we have with uh, accounting people in general. And I, you know, I'm a finance guy. I teach finance and accounting at university. I've been chief financial officer of, what, five, six different companies. Uh, but there seems to be this myth that uh, anybody with some kind of an accounting designation, and I'll use CPA because that is the most common one, that automatically, because they've got a CPA behind their name, they are effective and efficient cash managers. And that that simply is not the case. Uh, in fact, many people with CPAs, and I hate to say this, I'm going to get a bunch of hate mail from CPAs, but I've actually met a lot of CPAs that really are not very good accountants. But that's a different story. Uh, the the fact is, is most CPAs and, and most people who profess to be accountants can do a reasonable job of putting together your books. That means making journal entries and, and paying bills and, and making bank deposits and reconciling bank accounts. But there's a huge leap between that kind of record keeping and actually managing the cash of a business. 
And and so often I've I've had business people come to me and they would say, just like you said, the CEO should sign the checks. And they said, well, I, they said, you know, we're out of cash. So how did that happen? Well, I have a bookkeeper who's supposed to be in charge of all of this stuff. Bookkeepers are never going to be in charge of all of this stuff. Yes, they may do a reasonable job of record keeping, but they are not going to manage your cash. And in small entrepreneurial ventures, cash is king. So that is really good advice. You need to be, if you're the CEO of a small company, you be you need to be looking at every dollar that's going out of the bank account, every dollar that's coming in. And in fact, uh, my opinion is if you're the CEO of a small organization, you should be looking into the bank every single day yourself, going online and checking uh-huh. those bank balances and see what cleared and what came in. Okay, Marty, uh, once again, where can people get a hold of you if they're interested in finding more about you and your services? Well, uh, again, it's on the, the Internet. I'm on the Internet. Uh, I have my website, www.startupprofessionals.com, and from there you can find my blog, you can find my writings, or you can do a search for Marty Zwilling on the Internet and find uh, all the articles that I've written. That's great. And and I, I'm actually going to do that because I, I'll be honest with you, and I apologize for being an uninformed citizen here. I'd never heard of you, but gosh, I love the stuff you're talking about. You've given such great advice. I'm going to go on and check out your website and, and uh, start following your, your blog. Uh, and I think you're doing a great service here because uh, we need entrepreneurs. This is how this economy of the United States works. Uh, we don't all work for the government. We don't all work for huge corporations. We need small businesses out there creating creating jobs, and uh, we need that entrepreneurial spirit. So, uh, Marty, thank you so much for being with me today. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you, Mike. I appreciate being here, and uh, anybody is free to send me an email as well. My my uh, email address is marty at startupprofessionals.com, and uh, check me out on the Internet for any kind of advice as well. Great. It's your host, Mike Manahan. It's BizRap Radio, and we will be back right after these words. And welcome back to Biz Rap Radio. It's your host, Michael Manahan, and thanks for sticking with us. Really do appreciate it. Hope you're enjoying the show. And if you just joined us, that was Marty's Willing, startup professionals whom we've had on in the previous part of the show. Uh, very interesting stuff. Marty's a great guy, huge follower, author, uh, uh, blogger, articles in places like Forbes magazine, Huffington Post. He's a guy to follow and watch. Very, very intelligent character and a lot of great ideas for small business people. If you've not listened to us before, it is Biz Rap Radio. I'm your host, Michael Manahan. We are the show all about small business and entrepreneurs. We're here to help you, small business people, help you make more money, uh, run your businesses more effectively, have more fun running your businesses. We have guests on the show each week who have ideas and strategies that can help you do a better job with your business. Uh, many of them are marketing experts. So we've had experts on uh, on uh, corporations, how you should set up your corporations. We've had tax experts on. We've had people on who know how to raise money. Uh, just a huge, uh, and we've had entrepreneurs on it. Don't forget the entrepreneurs. I love it when entrepreneurs come on this show. I love to hear their trials and tribulations and how they're doing and raising the capital and getting their businesses started, which of course is no easy task. Uh, our, our dear old friends in the federal government have made it increasingly difficult for small businesses to raise capital. Uh, and although there's supposed to be some changes with the job Jobs Act that came into effect back in, or that was passed in 2012. It hasn't come into effect yet. I mean, the major uh, thrust of the Jobs Act, which we were anticipating, was this crowdfunding where you could go out and sell uh, shares in your company in small amounts, $500, $700, $1,000 to uh, just basically anybody out there, yeah, that still has not come into law. And, of course, it was designed to help the economy, help us recover from the recession. Uh, by the time it uh, it is uh, passed, well, who knows? We may be in a uh, another recession by that time. But anyway, this past uh, week I had the opportunity to do a presentation at a law firm. The law firm was Givner & K. 
their website, givnerk.com. That's G-I-V-N-E-R-K-A-Y-E.com. Uh, Givner and K, they are estate planning specialists, and they also have a very strong expertise in international taxation. Uh, now, you know, you, you think about that international taxation, well, you got to be some big, huge corporation to be worried about that. But these days, a lot of small companies are operating internationally. So you might think about whether you have international tax implications if your company is operating in more than one state but the or more than one country. But the presentation, the focus of my presentation at Givner & K., was on raising money, on helping uh, small businesses raise money. And I uh, gave a talk, which I've given a number of times, called The Seven Sins of Raising Capital. That's right, The Seven Sins of Raising Capital. Of course, all of these are covered in my book, The Secrets to Raising Capital, which you can purchase on Amazon for less than 20 bucks. But... Um, but nevertheless, you know, sometimes presenting these things in person makes a difference. So I was down at Givner & K at their offices, and they had not only people into their big, very large conference room that they have, but in addition, they had many people listening online to their podcast while I gave the presentation, The Seven Sins of Raising Capital. Uh and and I'm going to talk about some of those right now. I don't know if we'll get through all of them because we're in the last segment of the show. But 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 for anybody who's out there raising money, you really do understand that funding a business is not an easy task. You are in competition with every other business that is out there looking for money. And I think sometimes entrepreneurs forget that. They tend to think they're somewhat in isolation as if the money source, whether it's an investment banker, a uh, venture capital fund, uh, uh, you know, an angel investor, wherever the, the money's coming from, I, I find entrepreneurs tend to think that they're kind of dealing with the money source in isolation. And of course, that's not the case. The money source is looking at you and is also looking at many other businesses in which he or she can deploy the capital that they have to invest. And so it's not just a matter of you looking good. You also must look better than the competition, better than the other people who are trying to get money out of that same person. And as I call them, they're the money guys, the guys with the money, right? Uh, so sin number one, you know, it might not be the Academy Awards, but you are on stage uh, you are being judged. Uh, everything from how you answer questions to what, how you dress to how you act, your mannerisms, your confidence level, the quality of the materials that you present when you're trying to raise capital for your business. All of that is how you are representing you and your business. And the last thing you want uh, is is uh, for the money guys to discount you because of what I would call your appearance, and of course that's that's just not your physical appearance, but I mean it's it's your it's everything that you present, whether it be a a one sheet uh, summary of your business opportunity, whether it's your financial projections, whether it's your business plan, whether it is you in person, in an office, you are on stage and you have to look the part. And so you want to pay a lot of attention to that. Okay, let's move on. Sin number two, give up the need to be right and don't argue with the money guys. You know, the guys with money, they, they have money for a couple of reasons. Now, I guess some of them, you can say, well, they got lucky. I don't know, some of them may have inherited the money. But most people I know with money, you know, earned it. And they earned it in a variety of different ways. And uh, while that doesn't make them geniuses, it, it certainly doesn't make them fools either. And typically people who've made money, uh, just from their personality perspectives, they, they like to think 
they can give you, the person who is looking for money, advice, advice about your business perhaps. Why don't you try this? Or here's an idea for you. Or I didn't see this in your business plan. So many times I've seen entrepreneurs start to argue with the money guys. Don't argue with the money guys. If a money guy says, hey, you should consider this in your business plan, you pull out your pad of paper and your pan Say, yeah, that's a great idea. Let me make a note of that. The next time we're working on the business plan, we'll see if we can't incorporate that. There's no point in arguing with the money guys. You'll never win. And, and you might just turn the money guys off because they might decide that, hey, you're not a team player. You're not a person that's going to take suggestions. You're not open to new ideas. And that might very well be a reason why, uh, why you don't get the money you're looking for. Okay, sin number three. Uh, know your competition. And remember, every business has competition. The number of times I've talked to entrepreneurs who are trying to raise money and I've asked, you know, who is your competition? And they, oh, we don't have any competition. We're unique. Well, you know, that, that, that's crazy if you think that way. Every business has competition. You need to know who the competitors are. And by the way, <clears throat> if it's not competition today, it who's your competition going to be tomorrow? When you're as successful as you say you're going to be, who else is going to move into the market? Who's going to be out there gunning for you? So it's it might not be your competitors that exist today. It could be those competitors who will move into your market when they see you making lots of bucks. Okay, sin number four, the last one we're going to cover today. You may be the problem. Teams have a greater chance of being funded. Yes, I know that entrepreneurial seed tends to come from one individual very often, but you need to build a team around you, a team that can execute. Everybody has different skills. Some people are better sales guys. Some people are big pitchers. Some people are detail-oriented. Some people uh, are technology-oriented. Uh, you need a team. Teams will have a much better chance of raising the capital you need than if you're trying to go it alone. And by the way, that means a real team. It's not this kind of laundry list of advisors whose names you have, have grabbed out of a hat just so you could build out an advisor list. These need to be people who are really involved in the business. Well, there's some ideas for you. We'll cover more in another edition of BizRap Radio. You know, here at BizRap Radio, we believe we can fix the United States of America through a fundamental concept that individuals pursuing their own economic interests in free markets will create more prosperity for more people than can ever be achieved through government regulation and a planned economy. BizRap Radio, fixing America through individual economic freedom. That's it for this week. We'll be back again next week with another edition of BizRap Radio.